Okay, so back to our definition. Hospital acquired pneumonia is a term that we use for pneumonia that people get when they're in the hospital. Okay, so not surprising the terminology. Community acquired pneumonia is pneumonia that is acquired out in the community. Now, the typical definition used to differentiate these two is if the patient suffers symptoms of pneumonia 48 hours after admission to the hospital, then it is probably a hospital acquired versus earlier symptoms, it's community acquired. So in other words, when your patient is admitted to your floor with pneumonia, coming up from the emergency department with pneumonia, that is community acquired pneumonia. When your patient has been on your floor for quite some time and now has developed pneumonia, that is hospital-acquired pneumonia. Now we're going to add a third definition here today that maybe you've heard a little bit of word about, and certainly you're going to hear more about this in the near future, and that's called healthcare-associated pneumonia. Healthcare-associated pneumonia is a new term that we're kind of tossing around here a little bit, and what it refers to is people who have been hospitalized have hemodialysis or otherwise receive intravenous chemotherapy or reside in a nursing home or long-term care facility. Now these types of patients are going to be at risk for getting some of the bugs that we have in the hospital. So it's not, you know, it, 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 it's kind of like hospital-acquired pneumonia, but not really. So it's like hospital-acquired pneumonia in that we're getting it from healthcare workers and from our healthcare institution. The difference is that these people, for the most part, aren't in the hospital. So they're either in a nursing home setting or they're at home and they're developing the same kind of pneumonia that our patients would in the hospital. Okay, so this is not just going to be our patient who is on the med surge floor or in the ICU that develops a hospital-acquired pneumonia, but if we're going to broaden the definition a little bit, which we should because it's the same etiology, and broaden the definition a little bit and call it healthcare associated pneumonia that also brings in people who are being treated on an outpatient basis and patients who are being treated in long-term care. Now what differentiates these things primarily is going to be the way that we get the bug and the kind of bugs that are involved. Hospital acquired pneumonia more often than uh, community acquired pneumonia is going to involve resistant organisms like MRSA. Community-acquired pneumonia is going to be more typical uh, types of bugs that we would normally associate with being out there in the community. So let's take a look at hospital-acquired healthcare-associated pneumonia, how this happens in our patient, and then we're going to talk about how we can try to prevent it. There are some factors that lead up to the patient becoming colonized. So in your handout on page one, it talks about these factors that lead to colonization of the respiratory tract. Now the normal process is that if you were to get bacteria into your mouth, you have normal flora in there that compete with the bacteria and don't let it take hold. Then we have salivary flow that washes the mouth out and it washes the bacteria down the esophagus into the stomach acid and the stomach acid kills it. Now that's the normal process. Think about what happens to our patients who are in the hospital. Our patient in the hospital oftentimes is receiving systemic antibiotics. And those systemic antibiotics could be killing off the normal flora in the mouth, allowing that bacteria to take hold. In fact, we've been able to culture the same bacteria that is in the lungs on the plaque on the patient's teeth. Okay, so it's starting to take hold there. In addition, our patients oftentimes are not eating like they would at home so they have decreased salivary flow. So our patients are not getting the same kind of diet they do at home, they're not eating the same way they would at home, and so they have decreased salivary flow. Now we wash these bugs down the esophagus into the stomach, but in many of our patients, they're on GI prophylaxis. So they're on proton pump inhibitors like Protonix and Amiprazole and those kind of medications, or they're on some other thing like H2 blockers or something else that's decreasing our stomach acid. Now the problem with decreasing stomach acid is that the patient's stomach is then going to become a better place for bacteria to live. Okay, so decreasing the stomach acid helps to decrease ulcers, but it also increases the risk the patient can develop pneumonia. Some of the other things that can cause a patient or increase the risk of colonization include having the patient 
NPO. So your patient who's not eating is not going to be using the gut the way they normally would, and therefore they can be at a higher risk for developing pneumonia. Now here's how that happens. When we're not using the gut, bacteria from the gut translocate into the bloodstream. Okay, so if we're not using the gut, there's a chance that bacteria in the gut can translocate across the membranes there and get into the bloodstream, and then it kind of gets stuck in the lung because the lung has a high surface area. So then how does this bacteria get to our patient? How does colonization take place? Well, the first way that you can probably all relate to is on our hands. So, you know, nurses have been taught for a long time now the importance of hand washing. And I think we're pretty good about hand washing, but about, what about some of the other healthcare workers? Some of your other peers that come in contact with your patient. And if you think about it, there's a lot of different people who come in contact with your patient. The nurses, the physicians, aides, techs, dietary, housekeeping, physical therapy, occupational therapy, respiratory therapy, clergy, family, visitors. Lots of people come in contact with your patient. How many of them are washing their hands or changing their gloves? See, this is a very important concept that we need to start being more aware of. Obviously, we're paying attention to ourselves and how we're washing our hands, etc., but we're not paying that much attention to other people. If we can't get people like our physicians to wash their hands, maybe we can at least get them to use hand sanitizers. Hand sanitizers do decrease the risk of infection. Uh, for those of us at the bedside, it's very helpful in decreasing the amount of time that we spend with hand washing. In fact, one study recently found that you can save one hour per 12 hour shift by using hand sanitizers rather than washing your hands. Okay, that's huge. You know, we're always talking about where we can find more time to spend more time with our patient. You know, how many times have you said, boy, if I only had a few extra minutes that I could have spent with that patient today, right? Well, this is one of the ways that we can find that extra time. We need to be looking for all the ways possible that we can get more time into our day to spend with our patients, and this is one way. Rather than washing your hands with soap and water, now obviously you need to do that if your hands are grossly soiled with you know, with some things. But other than that, we can use hand sanitizers and that decreases the risk of infection. And at the same time, if your patient is intubated in an intensive care setting, then we can develop subglottic secretions. Now, subglottic secretions are secretions that form above the endotracheal tube. So it's forming above the cuff of the endotracheal tube and those secretions are sitting there. Now, that's not very far away from the mouth, so bacteria from the mouth gets down there into those secretions. That's a nice, warm place for bacteria to grow. Bacteria starts to grow in these secretions, and it migrates down around the endotracheal tube, gets into the lungs, and causes the patient to develop pneumonia. Another way that colonization can take place is by way of the nasogastric tube. So what happens is this tube is going into the patient's nose, and basically right back toward the sinuses. Bacteria follows that tube back to the sinuses, causes a sinus infection, and there's a high degree of correlation between sinus infections and pneumonia in your patient. Of course, keeping your patient MPO, we talked about that. There can be a translocation of bacteria. And lastly, acidosis increases the risk. So here's a number of different risk factors. Let's take a look at the list on the left. The list on the left, oh, you know, when you start looking at this stuff, this covers just about every patient you care for, doesn't it? So that means a lot of our patients are going to be at risk for developing hospital-acquired pneumonia.